another historian um, on the podium here, on the platform this afternoon, and one with whom I would spar, but not without gloves. Um, Representative Dan Itzy, for those of you who yeah, know Representative Itzy, he is a, um, a scholar, um, an engineer, an inventor. We have a common background in power generation systems. Mine's probably longer than yours, but that's okay. But Dan and I have these discussions about the Constitution and about freedom and about liberty and about history. And so one of these days we're going to have a pay-per-view and you're all going to be invited. Oh, Representative Itzy. Thank you, Sue. First, I want you to know that you know, we hear a lot about the Free State Project, and I have another name for them. Reinforcements. <laughs> I've got a question for you. We've heard the Second Amendment read a couple times. I'll read it to you again, and I've got, got a question for you. Depending on your answer, you may shorten what I have to say. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Does that protect you from the goobers in government? No. <laughs> Is that his purpose? Yes. No. I want you to think about this. Tenth Amendment the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited to it by the states, uh, by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Article 1, Section 10, no state shall, no state shall, no state shall. Fourteenth Amendment, no state shall enforce any law which shall make abridge the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States. Nor shall any state. Nor shall any state. You don't see that kind of language in the Second Amendment. That amendment is designed to restrict the general government. I want you to think about, think about it. The, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. Why a militia? Well, let's look at the introduction to the first militia law of New Hampshire as a free state under the Constitution of 1776. Whereas it is not only the interest, but the duty of all nations to defend their lives, liberties, and properties in that land which the supreme ruler of the universe has bestowed upon them against all unlawful attacks and depredations of all enemies whatever, especially those who are moved by a spirit of avarice or despotism. Now you might think that was just thinking about people who would in invade from other lands. But listen to Alexander Hamilton, and I'm going to read you a paragraph out of Federalist Paper 28. The prior paragraph, he says, you don't need to be worried about the overreaching government, we're, or the government we're creating overreaching, because the legislatures of the states will be there, and they will properly apprehend such overreaches and protect you. But, the great extent of the country is a further security. We have already experienced its utility against the attacks of a foreign power, Great Britain, and it would have precisely the same effect against enterprises of ambitious rulers in the national councils. If the federal army should be able to quell the resistance of one state, the distant states would have it in their power to make head with fresh forces. The advantages obtained in one place must be abandoned to subdue the opposition in others. And the moment the part which had been reduced to submission was left to itself, its efforts would be renewed and its resistance revived. Do you see what that is? That is a battle strategy 
of the states against the general government, proffered by Alexander Hamilton in the Federalist Papers. What were they thinking? Why a militia? This proportion would not yield, now this is Madison in Federalist 46, and he's just described how a, a nation cannot support a standing army of more than 25% of its citizens capable of bearing arms or 1% of the general population. This proportion would not yield in the United States an army of more than 25 to, or 30,000 men. To these would be opposed a militia amounting to nearly half a million citizens. With arms in their hands, officered by men chosen from among themselves, fighting for their common liberties, and united and conducted by governments possessing their affections and confidence, it may well be doubted whether militia thus circumstanced could ever be conquered by such a proportion of regular troops. Those who are best acquainted with the last successful resistance of this country against British arms will be most inclined to deny the possibility of it. Besides the advantage of being armed, which Americans possess almost over the people of almost every other nation, the existence of subordinate governments to which the people are attached and by which the militia officers are appointed form barriers against the enterprises of ambition more insurmountable than that than any which a simple government can admit of. Why a militia? The militia was intended to be your defense against not only say Canada or some foreign power from Europe but against an overreaching general government as well. That same militia law that I read to you, the introduction of, and its subsequent embodiments, required that every able-bodied man, 16 to 50, later reduced to 40, not exempted by profession or disability, would be in the training band, the first order of the militia. And everybody else, not exempted by conscientious objection, would be in the alarm list, the second order of the militia. And every one of those militia members was required to have a firearm and accoutrements. You see, when they say is the Second Amendment an individual right or a corporate right, it's not a legitimate question. It's the same thing. Every individual was be required to be armed, required to be armed, so that they could exercise their corporate power. So what restrains us? Remember, life, liberty, and property? Article 2, all men have certain natural, essential, and inherent rights among which are enjoying and defending life and liberty and acquiring and protecting property. And in a word of seeking and obtaining happiness. Implicit in that, if you're going to defend life and liberty and protect property, you must be properly armed. Some 200 years, because people were getting a little squishy, <laughs> we strengthened it and made it explicit. All persons have the right to keep and bear arms in defense of themselves, their families, their property, and the state. But then there's Article 12. Every member of the community has a right to be protected in it in the enjoyment of his life, liberty, and property. Does that sound familiar? Yes. And they owe their share of the expense of such protection and to yield their personal service when necessary, the militia. And then we get to Article 24. A well-regulated militia is the proper, natural, and sure defense of a state. Why is that in the Bill of Rights? What does it mean if that's in the Bill of Rights? 
it's, it's somehow it's got to be tied to something that you're owed. Maybe, just maybe, it is your right to be organized into a well-regulated militia. Yeah! yeah. Woo! Yeah. Okay, so then what does the Second Amendment do? What is the meaning of that second clause, that second part, uh, sentence piece? The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Why would they put that in there? Because if the general government could deprive you of your right to keep and bear arms, it, could it would in effect deprive the states of their militias and their power to resist the general government. So, is this a Second Amendment rally? Eh, in part. It is, an, is it an Article II rally? I hope so. Is it an Article II rally? Yes. Is it an Article IIA rally? Yes. Maybe, just maybe, is it an Article 24 rally? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Hell yeah. Okay. Now I want you to wrap your heads around this. You guys remember the, how many of you saw Blazing Saddles? Okay. You remember the, the sheriff holding himself hostage? Okay. Theater of the Absurd. If the people are the defense of the state, the state cannot practice tyranny. I want to play a little game with you here. When, when we go down to the well and we're going to have a recorded vote, we do something called a parliamentary inquiry. And it's our last chance to state the case to make the draw the lines as clearly as possible. And we say to the, the speaker, you know, uh, we ask, if I know this and I think that and I believe the other thing, would I now press the red button or the green button as appropriate? I'm going to address the MC as I would address the speaker because that's pretty much the same role actually. Okay. And I'm going to ask you to do something. Madam MC, if I am ready to demand that the governor will or at the order of the legislature will organize me into a well-regulated militia on the count of three, would I now give three government-curdling huzzas? One, two, three. Huzzah! 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 Ouch. Yeah! We're all troublemakers <laughs> and rabble rousers. Yes. Clock TV.